can tell me how long they think it takes to conduct a systematic review. Something of that nature. Give a number. Two years. Two years? Anything? Higher or lower? Six months. Six months? Okay. It's about 18 months. So, about 18 months on average. Depends on the question, of course. Who can tell me how much you think a systematic review costs? So something that's just a ballpark. Yeah, fifty thousand. Yeah, fifty thousand. Fifty thousand. Fifty thousand. Fifty thousand dollars. So you have eighteen months and one hundred and twenty thousand dollars. How many of you will be in a position where your minister has a question and that's what you said that to happen? With this rapid evidence assessments are my favorite form of synthesis for policy, and all they all they are is. They are inspired by systematic review, reviews, i.e. they have the same approach to thoroughness and rigor and quality. But a scaled down version, they are carried out usually between one to three months, depending on the team you have and the resources you have. They are significantly cheaper, by the way. Where you have the complete thorough searching, I feel indicated, where you go through all the databases and you're buried in libraries with books and things, you can skip some of that. You find the right databases where you're more likely to find the evidence you need and you use those. So it's a scaled down version, but it borrows heavily from the approach. The key message is the same. We are looking across the body of evidence. We're trying to synthesize that knowledge, and we're trying to get a picture of what the body of evidence says. So I've alluded to how you search. You search using the three arms, which are searching online, searching within um, libraries and print copies, though we're doing less and less of that, and looking within the gray literature, which is where people tend to hide um, negative information. I'm probably being a bit unfair. But the key thing is the evidence is critically appraised, summarized, and the caveats and qualifications are transparent. <clears throat> I think this is really, really important. This, we're not in the business of saying, yes, minister, this is going to work. It's about communicating nuance. But like I've said, it's, it's a much shorter process. It's a scaled down version. So there are limitations, and we have to be aware of that. My key message is always about communicating those limitations. It is not a comprehensive review of the literature. But you have to be explicit about exactly what you're searching for. It is, it is more subject to bias, statistical bias. And we must therefore proceed with a, lot, a bit more caution. There are some purists in the synthesis world who believe, oh, you must always do a systematic review or nothing else at all. But in the policy environment, you're lucky if you have four months to summarize the evidence. Three. You're lucky if you have three months. Two months. <laughs> <laughs> because you're lucky if you have weeks. So in that kind of context, this is my go-to synthesis product. And I use it, we use it a lot at DFID, and it's something that I, you know, we're going to increasingly use, use. And that feels caution. Proceed with caution. Know the limitations of what you're working with. However, one of the greatest challenges in a policy environment is how do you tell people what we don't know? Right? You fund research. I mean, we, we spend, DFID spends hundreds of billions of dollars on research every year. But we, if you tell a minister we, we don't know the answer to this problem, then what are we paying researchers for? But how do you communicate what we don't know? My second favorite form of synthesis is the evidence gap map. This is one that Phil did looking at um, extreme poverty, and I'll show you an example that I did as well. But Phil, do you want to talk through? Yeah, so, just before we do that, I want to make a couple of points about REAs. How are they different from systematic reviews? In a systematic review, every paper is read twice by two, pe uh, read by two independent people. So that's 1,300 papers, where we usually get out of a few hundred. But that's a lot of reading. It has to be done twice, and they have to have, all, they have total con concurrence. If they can't agree, we have a third person party read it, and they adjudicate. We don't do that with an REA. Only one person reads, or we read double, one in 10, one in five, because we, can't, we haven't got time. So that's one sort of corner cut. That's, um, Similarly, when we critically appraise against our criteria and when we extract the data, with a systematic review, everything's done double. We can't do that with a systematic review, with an REA. We simply do it with one person doing it and doing a one in 10 check. And that's why our colleagues in the systematic review movement actually get very upset with us. I have been called a traitor. And I said, I'm happy to go to the tower because it's a uh, it's a sin I'm quite happy to die for. Well, not quite. Um, uh, but it's an important issue that, that there is, there are people who don't like rapid evidence assessments because they're not the pure science. But we're not claiming them to be. Alex and I have both been in decision-making circles in, in the British government where we've had to get something out in weeks and months. 
And we've made a massive impact by being able to put up the best available evidence as opposed to no evidence or the classic evidence of finger in the wind. We do not want finger in the wind. This is much, much better than that. Okay, the gap maps. So they came about because we were trying to map what do we know about a subject, right? And what we did here on this, on this axis, the vertical axis, now this is about what is the evidence available, what is the available evidence, sorry, on extreme poverty. There's a lot of things done to reduce extreme poverty. Are they effective? But before we ask the effectiveness question, where's the evidence? So these are a long, long list, over 65 policy interventions that are frequently used in governments around the world, conditional cash transfers, unconditional cash transfers, in-kind, employment assistance, oh, it goes on and on and on. These are real policy initiatives. On the horizontal axis, we're looking at the outcomes that these policies say they want to achieve. Okay? Things like access to money, access to skills, increased knowledge and skills, increased employment, blah, 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 raised living standards, better health, better education. So we're trying to say where, where is the interface between what we do, our inputs, and what we achieve in our outputs? Where's the evidence? Um, <clears throat> And uh, can you just zoom out? Uh, right. <clears throat> so this, this zooms out a lot more. But already on this first zoom out, or is it panning out? I don't know. These guys can tell me. We're beginning to see, first of all, that in some areas we've got an awful lot of evidence. OK? The circles indicate there is evidence. The gray ones tell me that they are impact evaluations. And the red ones tell me they're systematic reviews. The bigger the circle, the more the evidence base. And I'll just illustrate this. Um, uh, Alex is not happy with Max as, uh, as, as I am. Um, if I just show you, we've got to switch onto the internet for a second. I want, this is something that we want you to do when you've left this session. So now we're dealing with it in real time. If I hover over this one, it tells me that uh, Oh, it can't be 50. Yeah, we've got 57 impact evaluations on the impact of credit leasing and the outcome there is income, increase in income and savings. Okay? So there's 57 impact evaluations. No, wrong one, but it's oh, have I? I've got the wrong one. Oh, I've, I've moved now. It doesn't matter. <clears throat> if I click on this, this is about the unemployment subsidy program in Colombia, an assessment. If I click on that, it will take us to a one-page summary of what it says, written by us at 3IE, OK? So that tells you what it's about. Uh, sorry, that's not the summary. That just tells you what it's about. And if I click on this, it will take me to the actual article, the, the paper, OK? If I can open it up. It does take a little time sometimes. Is it? Uh, where's the churn? It's, yeah, it's, well, don't worry. Please trust me on this one because <laughs> we could waste time. It will it'll pop up in a minute. OK, <clears throat> so that's the first thing. If I go back uh, here, that's where it is, by the way. Down there, it's in the Find Evidence tab. And let me do that while I'm here. <clears throat> if you click on this Find Evidence tab, you've got four databases. <clears throat> one is on policy briefs, which are still being developed. But this is a, a database of systematic reviews of effectiveness studies in lower and middle income countries, of which you will find the 303. We're going to look at that in a minute if we, yes, we have time. Then we have our database of impact evaluations and our database of gap maps. If you could just click on it and it'll bring it up again. Uh, and you will see that we've got quite a few gap maps on here. One is on youth and transferable skills. Give you go. Peace building, that's a very important one done with the US, uh, water, sanitation, hygiene, that's one that I was involved with. Primary, so that's one of ours. At three, we did this internally. This is the one that we were looking at. OK. So what I wanted to show you, if it ever comes up again, there we go. I'll take it down. So I showed you that by clicking on those little circles, you can find out that the study. Now, on here, we've only got four systematic reviews. OK. Uh, and I can, and it also tells me if I get the blue one, there is one protocol, one that's being done. 
So you now know what has been done and is being done in the area. But the point we want to make here, this is where I'm going to go back to my slide, is when we did this on extreme poverty, just think how much work's been done on extreme poverty in the last 20 years. If I go to this, if it allows it to just switch. There we go. We found these are the policy areas that USAID is really interested in because they're invested in it. This was a very patchy area. There wasn't much around. This one, we couldn't find any studies except for one on the relationships between insurance and access to markets. One study in 20 years. We find another one here. There is no evidence. If it is, we don't. We we really search for it. So it's hard. Even if there were one or two, it's not going to be much more than that. So we have evidence gaps. The story gets worse because USAID said to us they were interested in certain priority outcomes. Look at that. There is some evidence in some areas, but look at the gaps here, here, and here. Okay. These are priority areas in which a major international aid organization is investing a lot of money in policy. We have no evidence as to whether it's working or not. So that's the bad news. The good news is that that now allows us to change our research procurement for the next five to ten years. And that's what we're using it for. So it has a double purpose. It tells us what we know and what we don't know. Two purposes. A third purpose is it allows us to now procure research and evaluation where we have gaps. And this is why it's taken off, to use that awful modern phrase, it's gone viral. Everybody's in on the act, uh, which means we have, by the way, differential qualities of gap map, which is something we're addressing. But DFID have also started doing them. Uh, this is where Alex is going to show you how they do them. And just for your note, IRC. Sorry, can I ask you to repeat the three main objectives of these? The first one is to identify gaps. Where we have, ev oh, where we have evidence. Yeah. Second is where we don't have evidence. <clears throat> and the third is where we should be commissioning and procuring new research. So this is Alex's approach at DFID. And the IRC, the in, um, International Research Committee in New York, who work in our area of development, uh, they have a very similar and an excellent gap map series they're developing. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to work together because we don't all want to be doing the same gap map. We want to use our resources as efficiently as possible. Alex. So this is just to illustrate that there are other ways you can communicate that um, where, you, where you have evidence and where you don't have evidence. And so for me, it's a very compelling tool. You can put it in front of a policymaker and say, this is what we know. This is one that my team did, or my team commissioned, looking at security and justice. And we're working on a couple of others from other priority areas. But if you're interested in, so the greener the boxes, the more research we have available. And where you have red boxes, the fewer we have. And that tends to be. That, that tells you two things. One is where you can use synthesis. So if you're asking a question which falls into one of these green boxes, then you know you can synthesize evidence. There is something to synthesize. It doesn't tell you anything about the quality of what's available. It just tells you about the availability of research. You would then have to do all the quality appraisal that we talked about. If, for instance, you're interested in DDR, so that's um, demobilization, dearmament, and reintegration in post-conflict societies, and you're interested in that and, say, state and non-state actors, well, actually, there are only five studies you could find. So if you're going to set up a policy, you might want to take a more cautious, more pilot-type approach, and you might want to build an evaluation to learn from what you're doing. But to me, this is really compelling, because you can put it in front of a policy team and say to them, guys, this is what we're dealing with. How do we respond? Where you have evidence, you synthesize. Where you don't, you um, basically target or refocus your um, research resources. Or you take a pilot approach and a more evaluative approach. So there are many ways you can do this, but this is just to illustrate the, the fundamental principle that you can identify gaps in the, in the global knowledge base. Mm -hmm.